Uh, last night we talked about uh, Megan Kelly, her comments uh, yesterday on her Today Show uh, dealing with the issue of blackface. I said while we were live on the air, I got a phone call from one of her producers to actually come on the show. And so we were back and forth last night and actually barely made the flight to get there. And so today uh, on her show, uh, we had a second part of that conversation. And of course, as uh, Megan Kelly, they also invited Amy Holmes, who has a show on PBS, uh, who is a black female conservative, uh, to discuss this. Uh, and and uh, it was an interesting conversation, uh, and there were a lot of people who were texting me who were saying, don't do it, don't go, uh, this is a PR stunt, don't save her. Uh, but I thought about what Maya Angelou said to me a month before she died. Uh, and we had a conversation in the National when uh, they had a birthday party for her uh, at the African uh, Museum, uh, and the Smithsonian African Museum. And what's interesting is we were talking, I said, she said something about being a teacher, and I said, well, my brother and my sisters are teachers. She says, no, you're a teacher. She says, you use the medium to teach and educate people. And so that's why I went. And so we're going to show you uh, the whole segment. Well, then we'll discuss it uh, with our panel as well. So this is the conversation we had this morning on the 9 a.m. hour of Megyn Kelly today on NBC. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Megyn Kelly, and I want to begin with two words. I'm sorry. You may have heard that yesterday we had a discussion here about political correctness and Halloween costumes. And that conversation turned to whether it is ever okay for a person of one race to dress up as another. A black person making their face lighter or a white person making theirs darker to make a costume complete. I defended the idea, saying as long as it, as it was respectful and part of a Halloween costume, it seemed okay. Well, I was wrong and I am sorry. One of the great parts of sitting in this chair each day is getting to discuss different points of view. Sometimes I talk and sometimes I listen. And yesterday I learned. I learned that given the history of blackface being used in awful ways by racists in this country, it is not okay for that to be part of any costume, Halloween or otherwise. I have never been a PC kind of person. But I do understand the value in being sensitive to our history, particularly on race and ethnicity. This past year has been so painful for many people of color. The country feels so divided, and I have no wish to add to that pain and offense. I believe this is a time for more understanding, more love, more sensitivity and honor. And I want to be part of that. Thank you for listening and for helping me listen to. Roland, I did listen yesterday, and what was very clear in what I read and what I heard is that the history here, when it comes to that term and this issue, is deeply disturbing. I think the problem is, for African Americans, we know the history, and too many white Americans don't know or won't accept it, when the reality is, it is American history, yours and mine. When you look at blackface, white, white entertainers wore blackface uh, to mimic uh, African Americans, uh, to caricature African Americans. Uh, when you look at the minstrel shows, black entertainers were forced to wear blackface uh, because whites did not even want to see the humanity of black people, so therefore they had blackface. Uh, last night, I looked at Spike Lee's 2000 movie, Bamboozled, which dealt with this. 
and they actually, the Jada Pinkett Smith character actually talked about exactly how they created it. And what they did was they poured alcohol on two corks, burned it to a crisp, mashed it to a powder, added water and mixed it to a thick paste and then applied it to the faces of black people. Then they had put, would take red lipstick and put it on the lips, but then on the outside of the lips to create this, this, this image. But this thing went beyond just that. Uh, you look at the Jim Crow Museum that's at Ferris State University, where this is American history, where black people have been assaulted in magazines, television, radio, all of these images that have continued for, for centuries and, and then, of course, decades, going up to the 1960s and to some degree in the 70s, and we still see it present day. And so this is American history. The problem is too many of us grew up learning his story and not actual history. And that's the problem that we have to accept. And when we are grown, when we are educated, we have to go beyond what we were taught, what we learned in our households and say, I better be fully aware of real American history as opposed to being in denial about what, is, what actually took place in this country. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of it is that seeing a white person darken her skin, even for a costume, today evokes that past. Well, absolutely it does. It does, because you're speaking to, again, the history. Look, if you want to dress up like James Earl Jones and come into America, somebody sent me a photo, you can put the costume on. You don't have to darken your face. We have to deal with it. also the reality of colorism in this country, uh, that the American beauty standard since we were created, because this is about whiteness, okay? If we really want to be honest, America was created to be a white nation. The beauty standard was a blonde, blue-eyed, white woman. And so black women have had to deal with uh, the critique of their hair, their lips, and their hips, uh, and, and all of that. And so when you have to deal with that, uh, you're understanding how deep this thing is. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of King's assassination, the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, but also the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report, which said there were two white Americas, one white, one black. Most black folks who even came into journalism came in after the Kerner Commission, which was all based upon race riots. And so media, the reason this story boomeranged all around is because media has been the main driver of these racist caricatures throughout American history, and that's why it's such a huge story. Mm -hmm. People, don't, no one wants to talk about Bill Cosby these days, but the reason there was a black stuntman association is because Bill Cosby was standing next to, when he was doing I Spy, and they, in, and they had a scene, an action scene, and it was a white man who was putting on blackface to be his stunt double. Bill Cosby said, what? no, 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 y'all don't go hire somebody black. That's what led to the creation of the Black Stuntmen uh, Association. There was a documentary that was done on them. This, that was in the 60s. This is American history. We, we live in constant denial. Today, we're dealing with Confederate statues and monuments, and people are saying, well, okay, this is really no big deal why you're upset. But we have to recognize, over the last, look, I'm, I'll be 50 years old, November 14. How many universities have we seen where they've had thug parties and ghetto parties where white fraternities and sororities dressing up uh, in afros and blackface and wearing grills and putting on uh, uh, big chains to mimic African-Americans? Well, you want to mimic a, a rapper, mimic the white rappers out there, dress up like Eminem. But no, that's not exactly what is done. It is, that, that is a caricature. And you, when you have that constant assault... What people don't understand is that black people in America, next year will mark the 400th anniversary of the first 20-odd Africans arriving in this country in August of 1619 in Virginia. For 399 years, this constant assault, this degradation, and this demeaning of how we look and how we act. We are just 50 years removed from yeah. Dr. King's assassination. In 25 years, Megan, we will be a majority nation people of color. And white America has to come to grips with that because now that's going to mean power. That's going to mean economics. It's going to mean that, look, that, that the notion of what is considered American values will have to be now looked at differently because people of color will be also making that determination, not just white Americans. How, how do we talk about race and our country's history with race and have a real conversation? Here's the thing that we don't want to accept. This is what I call an informal gathering. You, no one person could control who sits in this audience. But we control who we eat lunch with. We control who we go to dinner with. 
We control who we invite to our houses. And if we really want to be honest, Americans live in silos. White folks stay with white folks. Black folks stay with black folks. Latinos stay with Latinos. Asians with Asians. Native Americans with Native Americans. And it's rare when in voluntary situations we actually cause ourselves, I need to learn more about you. I need to understand you and where you come from. But also asking the question, I don't know. I worked with a guy, Tim Madigan, who grew up in Iowa, didn't see black people until he went to college. He, all these racial things happen. He never understood why black folks responded the way he did until he wrote the book on the Tulsa race riot. And then he began to interview and he hears these stories of elderly black people kneeling in their homes and guns put to the back of their head and they were killed uh, based upon a lie uh, and how this whole town was, uh, was destroyed. Tim said, Roland, for the first time, I then understood why black people felt the way they did. And he said, as a white man, I had to force myself to own up to my lack of understanding, my lack of history. And I would say the same thing, Megan, whether it's you, whether somebody sitting in this audience, being honest that, wait a minute, how did I grow up? And have to go inside of yourself and say, what was I taught? What did my parents teach me? What did my friends teach me? And do I allow people to say things around me that have racial implications and I say nothing? Because I don't really want to upset the apple cart. Let me look at who's in my office. Who's on my staff? Who are executives? I've been in media since I was 14 years old. One of the fundamental problems we have, that white men still run media across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally, I mean, do understand, and this is just, understand how this thing impacts us. When I sat with Ken Jouts, executive vice president at CNN, I did, a, I did a pilot. He literally, I used the word brother. I was interviewing the guy who later became the first black president. And I talked about health care, and I said, man, that really hurt a brother having to file for bankruptcy because of health insurance. He said to me, hey, you know, be careful using the word brother because we don't want to alienate white viewers for being too ethnic. And I'm going, but that's my story, and I was talking to a black man. But Glenn Beck could use the word brother, and it's perfectly fine. And the fact that he would say that to me in that context is, wait a minute, hold up. Why can't I just be me? Why is it that, okay, you're too black, Roland? Well, how am I too black? Because I am black. <laughs> and so we have to understand how deep this goes because now it impacts raises, it impacts promotions, it impacts who we work with. And so we, I think, are in total denial of how deeply embedded race is in the DNA of America and how it impacts so many things that are done in this country. And if we have a discussion and just be honest, and somebody says, look, look, I don't know. Share with me. Yeah. Educate yeah. me. That also, I think, what changes it. And on a personal level, for all of us to challenge stereotypes that we may have about different racial and ethnic groups and say, wait a minute, is that fair? The way that I'm relating to other people or making assumptions? Uh, that's a part, I think, of the journey. But at th the last point is, I can play Diana Ross. I'm sorry, Megan, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 Megan, you, you can. No, no, Megan, don't. you can play Diana Ross just like you can play any other character, but you just put on a gown, grab a fan, and then have big hair, you're fine. <laughs> but that's the mistake that we make when we say, oh, I want to I cross that line. Yeah. There are lines, and there's history, and there's pain, and when we acknowledge that, then we can learn and grow from it. From it. But as long as we as Americans live in denial and act as if that stuff does not matter, then we will continue to have this problem in the next 400 years. Listen, I, well said. All I can say is, for my part, I have been listening and learning, and I'm grateful to both of you to have this conversation here on the set today and to those who reached out to me via Twitter. <laughs> um, I've heard you too. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll be right back. Now, of course, that was the edited version. We have the full version of the conversation on our YouTube channel. So go to youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. All right, let's turn to our panel. All right, folks, back to our Roland Martin Unfiltered video in just one moment. Now, a word from one of our Roland Martin Unfiltered partners. You've heard me say it before, and I will say it again. Write down this website, marijuanastock.org. That's marijuanastock.org. I'm going to tell you why it matters. Legal marijuana has grown to become a $9 billion industry in roughly six years. Forbes magazines predicts the market will continue to grow to nearly $50 billion in the next 10 years. So whether you like it or not, legal marijuana is a growing industry and it is only going to get bigger. Now, if you're an investor, you get it. You look for business models that are easy to understand and industries 
that are trending up. Our friends at Transatlantic Real Estate made their business very simple. They buy land that supports legal marijuana operations and lease it to high paying tenants. So you are investing in the landlord of a licensed marijuana farm. Stop working so hard for your money. Let your money start working for you by investing in the legal cannabis industry. You can invest as little as $300 up to $10,000, but you can't wait. This crowdfunding opportunity is only available for a few more days. They say that you either make things happen, watch things happen, or sit around wondering what happened. Don't be the person watching and wondering. Don't let another investment boom get away from you. It's time to make something happen for you, your finances, and your family. And don't forget my pro tip. To be included, you must complete and confirm your application. And be sure to complete the process. Go to MarijuanaStock.org. That's MarijuanaStock.org. Get in the game, folks. Do it now before time runs out. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, Video. Your thoughts? Thank God yesterday she was wrong about it because that meant today you had an opportunity to go before millions of people and give them the history of this country that they otherwise may have never, ever heard. I see it as a blessing that Megan, with her ignorant self, is in the Today Show slot and needed to cure it because in the curing of it, she made way for a conversation that had to happen and information to be provided around the world. So to me, well done, Roland. Scott, and you were talking about uh, you sat, watched this with some of your law partners? I did, I did, a number of them. And CNN is kind of on, but I happened to have it just on NBC. And I was on a phone call, and they were in my office with me. And NBC, I saw your face. I had to get off the phone. And I am deeply grateful that you chose to go. And I mean that. You and I go back and forth a lot, but I got to tell you, I've never been prouder. And, and here's the thing. Uh, you did that interview. That was your interview. You all, don't miss the move now. That was his interview. Yeah. Megan was just there, right? And he had a broad-based audience to share in a thoughtful, cogent, intelligent, African-American, intelligent-based representation mm -hmm. of a lot of points. The most important point I think you made, and I talked about this as the layperson uh, presenter at Reed Temple this past weekend, about the need for a national dialogue on race in this country to reconcile the issue of slavery, Jim Crow, Ku Klux Klan, uh, this history issue that you talked about. And it needs to come from the top. I, I challenge the AME Church to lead that effort, but I challenge our government officials, not this government that we have in place now, to lead that discussion. America has never reconciled itself never. on race. No. And it's, won't. it's never reconciled what it promises to be and what it is because we will not have that dialogue. White people think they've paid their dues because we've got mm -hmm. black billionaires and black people have, they took so much from us that we, we don't know who we are actually. I mean, when we talk in our employment places about black issues or black this, most of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people that look like you and me, Roland, we lower our voice. Other ethnicities don't lower their voice because we've been about conditioned. We've been That's and, and, exactly. And, and, and Julian, no, hold on, hold on. No, no, but follow me here. Right. So, finish your point, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go to you. Right. But, but we have been trained that way. And so we can't just continue to ignore this and act that the race issue in this country has gone away with time. we got to be comfortable and aggressive and make everybody else comfortable, black, white, yellow, and brown, talking about these issues. Julian, last week I was in Indianapolis um, and there was a state of black issues discussion that I moderated with Susan Taylor, Reverend Al Sharpton, and Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, and we're gonna air some of that later this week and also next weekend, live stream the whole thing this weekend. And I, I talked about Dorothy Cotton and she was over the Citizen, the citizen Education Project with SCLC. Everybody focuses on, well, they trained them to go out. Well, no. In her book, she said, no, they brought people in. They wanted to see where they were mentally, mm -hmm. how they view things, and they reprogrammed them yes. to send them go out. The, the, the thing for me is, and, and look, I saw all the commentary. Oh, my God, she's 47 years old. She's a white woman. How does she not know? Which is all legitimate. Mm -hmm. But what I do think we have to understand is that there are white people in this country who literally are growing up 
they don't see no black people. Mm -hmm. And there are black people yeah. <laughs> who are who are living in right. spaces right. where they don't connect with white people. And what happens is if you never ever sit and talk to somebody, you don't know what the hell's going on because you can forget what the hell you learned in school. It ain't real history. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, I think, sometimes force that conversation. And yes, teach some folks. Yes. Well, teach some folks. I'll first of all say, Roland, I want to commend you. You did a brilliant job. I think it was really great. I'm happy that you mentioned Tulsa. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing some work on my book that'll come out whenever I finish writing it on black money. And there's a piece in there on Tulsa. And one of the things about Tulsa is there's a guy who's written about what he calls segregated memories. So in Tulsa, you have white people who do not believe that Greenwood was burned by right. crazy white people. They just don't believe it. And even if you show them pictures, it, they, don't they don't believe it. It's fiction. And you have black people who, as you say, they lower their heads. They've heard about it. They're ashamed about it. But the shame is about the way that we have been bludgeoned by stereotypes. And what I think was so valuable about what you said is that you really walked us through some of those stereotypes, some of the whole thing about blackface and how it actually distorted. And as a result of that, how if you go back to like, my mom is 90 and she talks about when black women would not wear red because it was connected. That red is my favorite color, just the rebel in me, but it's connected to the way. And you're a Delta, so that's the red. Of course, gotcha. of course. But I, you know. And I'm a Kappa. But yeah, red. dressed like but, a Delta. So, <laughs> go ahead, go, go ahead, Julian. Oh, God. God, I that. But, but, but you know, but the Why point is that, that all of this, right. been, so black women could never feel pretty. So, right. So, so, you know, they have these. What was red connected to? The, the, Exactly, the lips, lips oh, see, right. and all of that, and so black women did not wear red. And you would hear your your our grandmothers, uh, mothers say, you know, only certain kind of women wear red or purple. There were colors that we just weren't supposed to wear. Breaking the stereotypes down is important. But Scott, not Scott, but both of y'all, because both of y'all make this point about conversation. You know, I'm the old head at the table. I mean, people keep talking about conversation. Bill Clinton talked about conversation. I want reparations. Well, here's the piece. I mean, the I Bill Clinton <laughs> conversation. But here's the piece, though. Both. The you Bill Clinton both. conversation was a fake conversation. And yeah. I called it fake then mm -hmm. because what they did was they wanted a nice conversation. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be controversial. When Megan asked that question, and this is what I said to her and the staff off air. Guess what? That conversation is going to end up being raw. Mm -hmm. It's going to end up being right. real. It's going to end up being where folks are going to be upset. And it takes somebody saying, I'm not going to cuss you out, but I'm going to sit here and we're going to have the conversation. Because there are things that happen every day. Like literally, the point I made about the guy at CNN. I got a text message. Somebody said, Roland, that was petty. You shouldn't brought it up. I said, no, it's real. I said, why? I said, oh, it's real. I experienced it. That's right. And it was like, well, no, no, no one knows him. I said, that's the point. The point is, there are individuals who you don't know who say things who are in positions of power. Who replicate. No, and, and, also and actually what he said was, he said that, then he also said, uh, I also showed it to my wife and she agreed. And I'm sitting there going, wow, the white wife agrees. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like, okay. That's better than you. And I'm going, <laughs> now, he didn't say, how did you get <laughs> Senator Barack Obama mm -hmm. to right. agree Mm -hmm. to shoot a pilot that will never air. Right. He didn't ask that question. Right. The first thing he said was, be careful using the word brother. We don't want to alienate white well, viewers. Yes, again. Which causes me to then go, okay, well, when we actually have conversations, what are you thinking? And what's your, what's your mm -hmm. thought process? What decisions are you making? And the reason I brought it up, because he's still there. He's still executive vice he's president. Still he's decisions. still over yeah. HLN. And I'm not calling him a racist. I'm saying by him raising that point, I then have to say, well, where's that coming from? Because if the white boy can say brother, mm -hmm. but he's a Christian and that's fine, why can't I say brother? Right, but Roland, I want to say one more the, thing really Hold on, Monique, Monique, thank you. The, Monique, thank you. the whitewashing of our culture that such that even when you have blacks in media they're not supposed to be black so we strip away the culture or in the case of blackface we ex you know we exaggerate the culture those are the only two options that we've had in america and in fact the blackface as i pointed out for when black people put it on well so they didn't actually act have to see have us to for real right. which happens to your point scott when it's lower your voice mm -hmm. change your clothes 
What's your approach? So what, they, what? But basically, what that says is, what the white values. We're going to strip you of your blackness, and we need you to walk like us, talk like us, act like us, go to the right schools, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Strip all of what makes us us. That's essentially the same as blackface. And well, it's and it's Dunbar. taught and it, by our elders, unfortunately, yes. well, because, because they knew the only way we could advance was by taking on those attributes and characteristics and stripping ourselves. Because no, Julian, I remember when I remember when Earl Graves, yeah. when he put in Black Enterprise magazine, mm -hmm. you gonna cut your dreadlocks. Yeah. Oh, so and there was, was a big a, controversy. That was brother, and he's, ha brother Harvey at Hampton told the young people in business school they could not have dreads, they could not have twists. But you know, a couple things. Uh, first of all, I was happy that you were with Megyn Kelly, but I'm not giving Missy a pass. Uh, you were there. Oh, absolutely. Perhaps, perhaps she got it. I don't think she got it. I think she's a fake Jake human being who has used the term political correctness more than once and even in that interview. The words PC should, if she was sorry, mm -hmm. then she should have just been sorry. And she is sorry, like the, one of the sorriest pieces of journalism that I've seen in a while, seriously. I mean, that using PC is justification. Just leave that alone. Number two, to the mask, and I think it's really important, your point about how we have had to basically uh, juggle the place between assimilating, accommodating, and being our black selves. I had a producer tell me once, back in the day, Roland, when I was doing a lot of TV, did my hair grow? He said, you're very pretty, but you'd be much more attractive if you had longer hair. Does your hair grow? I said, hair growth is a human function. <laughs> Everybody, hair grow. <laughs> and I cut mine like every four weeks. So, I mean, but to say that is like to dehumanize. Right, but, 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 but also, again, it's standard. And, and, and see, the thing, the reason I keep going back to the, to the images part, because that museum I talked about, the Jim Crow Museum, yes. it was Dr. Skip Gates who had that in his documentary, um, uh, African Americans, I think Many Rivers to Cross, I think that was the name of it. Um, and in that particular doc, so that, that was the first I heard of it. Uh, and what was amazing about um, that, yeah, the African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. So if you actually, where is it? So, you, it, so it's in uh, Big Rapids, Michigan. Okay. So it's hmm. at, at Ferris State University. Uh, all of you folks who are watching, if you just Google, do Google Skip Gates and, um, and Jim Crow Museum, the clip hmm. will come up. And at this museum, they have just tons of artifacts, mm -hmm. literally magazine ads. They have uh, billboards. They have all of the little trinkets. Mm -hmm. And you see the protruding lips, mm -hmm. the bugged out eyes, uh, the picaninny hair. You they see all of that. Derriere with black so women. they lay out in this whole museum the continuum. And the director in his interview said, shows, says to Gates, that there's no other group in the history of America that has had the sustained assault mm -hmm. yeah. on yes. their looks, <clears throat> on their hair, on their psyche than black people. Yeah. No other group, no other group. And so you take that from the 17 and 1800s and then the 1900s, and then you go through radio, and then, then you have Amos and Andy, and then of course you have the maids uh, mm -hmm. in movies, and then uh, a step and fetch it and the foot shuffling. And then you go through the demeaning characters in the 50s and then 60s. And you go through the ghetto characters in the 70s. You go through uh, the UPN show where they want to have the slaves uh, and uh, uh, Lincoln, it was a UPN show uh, where they got canceled before it even came yeah, on. They, they were gonna say that enslavement never occurred. I mean, freedom never occurred. Right, it, it was, it was like premise. a setting of the White House, Lincoln president, and we got some slaves. Like, are y'all serious? And so then you go through all this, so you go through, so, and how media played the role, because that's also what we constantly projected. Yeah. But Roland, let me, let me jump in here, because I want to continue one thought you had about assimilation and what they, they've dictated to black men and women for assimilation in corporate America in 2018. If you do all of that, right, you are still only acceptable to a certain point. Right. There is still a glass ceiling, and they are still... Um, the numbers of, of black CEOs and general counsels are still minuscule, comparatively speaking. And here's the thing they tell you is why, if you are acceptable, why you still can't get to the highest point. They will say he's too educated or she's too educated <laughs> by half, too smart by half, too well-dressed by half. 
Uh, uh, he went to the best schools. He, he's got a, a ton of business. He has large clients. He has assimilated in corporate America at the very best levels that you have dictated to, to your white counterparts. And yet, you are still only acceptable to a certain point. What are uh, you to do? It is like we're caught in this political economic vacuum or prism or vortex that says do all the right things as your mom and daddy told you. You do that and then you can only still get to a certain still point. Black. And, and, still black. Including and, compensation. But that's assimilation. Now right. flip that thing to how it also causes us to also then have self-doubt about <laughs> other black people. Yes. Yeah. The number of people, and this happened to me on numerous occasions, mm -hmm. brothers, men and women, black, who literally said to me when we had news one now, brother, when are you going to get you a show? And I was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm on TV five days a week. Right. What do you mean? Oh, no, no. That's and they the literally, and they literally show. said, no, 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 no. They said a real show. A real show. And I yeah, said, right. I said, what right. do you mean real show? They said, no, I mean like, you know, CNN, MSNBC. I said, bruh. <laughs> and so this is when Brian Williams was the evening news anchor of NBC. Mm -hmm. I said, bro, do you realize that when Brian Williams comes to Washington, D.C. to broadcast the NBC nightly news, that Brian Williams sits in the same chair that I sit in? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, uh, there's a table right next to that chair, and there's two shelves, and the bottom shelf is a bristle brush and a mirror. That ain't for Brian. <laughs> I said, that's mine. I said, the walls and the cameras in the control room are the same. I said, what you don't realize is we do the show at NBC News Channel in D.C. I said, we send the signal through the fiber optic line the same way they do. I said, you believe that my show isn't real because it's on a black network. I said, when it's the exact same place that Brian Williams uses. And he, and he looked at me like, Oh my God, what the hell? So what happens is we not, look, right here. I, I, had, I had a brother, I, people today. Somebody said, uh, well, you can't get a real show. And I said, really? Because <laughs> well, you got a digital show. Well, and I said, real? wait a minute. I said, did you see the news today that NBC is launching, have, they launched today a new streaming channel? I said, did you see the news that CBS has CBS in, which, has is, a, it too. which is a mm -hmm. digital right. channel? Mm -hmm. I said, did you see that Fox News next year is launching a digital yeah. channel? Yeah. Yeah. I said, so explain to me how it's bad that I have a digital show before, but they all are launching digital before, shows. So before they had this. Again, the how <laughs> we live, how we think, mm. so we're taking on, we, so we're degrading ourselves and saying, that ain't good. Right? We, Rola, it's just, it's, it's like what happens, in, what happens in, a, it, what happens in HBCU well, ahead, land, you. land, as it, it, you know, you have our people, we have brilliant, wonderful, phenomenal colleges in HBCU land, and we have black people who say things like, you know, I wouldn't send my child mm. to an HBCU. Your child, but some of your children need to be at HBCUs. Right. And HBCUs will provide the same level of education. If you look at a Howard, you look at a Morehouse, a Spelman, a Bennett, you know, the same level of education. Mm. And don't end me. Uh, <laughs> you want to say that, Chair? Uh, but the same levels of education that many other comparable schools do. So we really have been brainwashed. We have literally been taught that we are less than, and we have basically inculcated that, and there's no comprehensive way. I like what you said about the AME Church, but no comprehensive way for us to unpack that right. and to begin to talk about what's happened to us as a people. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. speaking of HBCUs, it's Howard Homecoming Week, so I'm going to need to see a sweatshirt. Uh, my point. You want to wear I wear HBCU <laughs> gear on Monday. Okay, well, this ain't you Monday. Still, you still have time. You still have time. Then the state I had it on Monday. Go ahead. H U. <laughs> you so, know. <laughs> so my point is, you made the to me the most critical point about the fact that in a very short time, the minority will be the majority, mm -hmm. and all of these things are going to have to be figured out. I was at a conference over the weekend, and one of the things Bishop Jake said is the reason why we don't have relationship is because we don't visit somebody different than us. So if you, if we take the time to visit Asian Americans, 
Caucasians, everybody. If we don't mm -hmm. silo, mm -hmm. if we do not get out of our silos, then we will be the same as the white people have been to us. Here's what here's why I made that but Julian, here's why I made that point. So a so, uh, graduate from Texas saying it. A black woman with a black journalist conference, she comes up to me and she says, Roll, I said, I gotta talk to you. I said, Okay. She said, She said, I go to Texas and she said, you know, and I hear you talk about the university and how much, you know, you and George are four years there. I'm like, yeah, she said, but you know, m my problem is it's just that, you know, how we'll be received by the white students. I said, Okay, I said, what do you mean? She said, So for instance, you know, we're going to Sabisa, which is our uh, a major cafeteria. She said, you know, the white students won't sit with us to eat. I said, okay. I said, you ever sit with them? She goes, what do you mean? I said, what I mean is, do you ever take your tray <laughs> right. and literally walk over? Uh -huh. I said, do you ever take your tray and walk over uh, and then sit down and say, how y'all doing? Anybody sitting here? Mm -hmm. She goes, why would I do that? I said, so help me out. Mm -hmm. You're asking white students to do what you won't do. I said, has it ever dawned on you? There's some white kids who go to A&M who have come from towns. They ain't never seen black people. Mm -hmm. I said, and there's some black students who have come from communities in Houston and Dallas who ain't never went, to, never seen there were white people. I said, what is the harm of you sitting down mm -hmm. and just talking to somebody? She literally said, that never crossed my mind. I said, mm -hmm. you can't ask of somebody else what you're unwilling to do. That's right. And and so I'm so it's not it's not kumbaya. It's just the reality well, that why can't I if 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 I got a, someone who's Asian or Latino who's or who's a woman, I have at some point I've got to get the hell out of my spot and actually talk well, to somebody. I don't I don't fully disagree with you, but the kumbaya let's have a conversation thing is played when you think about economic structures. See, I always come back to economic got issues. It, got it. When Monique talked about, well, if you don't go visit Asians or whatever, whatever, we're going to be the same. We're going to be the same unless we figure out how to deconstruct a capitalism that puts people at the periphery. It has nothing to do whether we have conversations or not. Well, but, Black but, folks, but hold on, hold on. we need to have but conversations by having the conversation, about money. It doesn't, it has we need nothing. to have economic conversations. Have, we need to be in rooms and chambers of commerce and boards so that we can learn what that thought process and Hold on, hold on, hold on, no, no, no. And, and see, I'm going to I'm going to give you the answer to that. You have some African-Americans, Robert Smith, the brother who's a billionaire, mm -hmm. who's been working with Reverend Al Sharpton on pension funds. Okay. And, and, and what they said is they said, wait a minute, you got all these white boys who got hedge funds and the, pen, and the, and the public pension funds, teachers, firefighters, police officers, they are the biggest pension funds that yeah. drive money to hedge funds. Mm -hmm. Black hedge fund managers not getting the money. So what happened? Sharpton and Smith and others, they go sit down with Randy Weingarten, AFT, and NEA, and they say, now look, y'all got all these black teachers yeah. who, are, who are funding your unions. Y'all, money, are going to white hedge fund managers. They laid it out. Weingarten says, and her team goes, you know what, you're right. CalPERS, the California right. pension fund, 500 million going to the black hedge fund. Mm -hmm. Black folks sat down with white folks. Yes. Explain to them this is what's happening. How do we leverage? Y'all are using black funds, and they went, "Damn, that's a good point. You right." And so now they're saying, "Let's go to the other pitch in the funds." To so, so to your point, if we don't tell somebody that and show them, and then say, "Now what y'all gonna do?" Right. Well, then that's, that's you, very different than this go to somebody's house, have a conversation nonsense. Monique, no, I'll do respect. No, 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 no. I just, I, I, I that's just, what you said. Visit. I'm no, quoting you. I said no, if no, you no. don't I'm visit, what you. I meant by visit was conversation. Spend I'm quoting you. time. It's, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's spend light, time. lightweight, okay, right. don't. No, but here's the deal, but here's the deal, Julian. Conversation is not. If I got somebody, if I got somebody white in the workplace. Ignorance starts at home. If I got somebody white in the workplace, who don't understand what black men and black women are going through, mm -hmm. and then if I'm able to enlighten them and educate them, then they then, if they are in the room that I'm not in, if I've done my job, they then might become champions of it. They may not, right. but at least I've said, look, here's what's going on, and you may not have any idea about it, Scott, yeah. in a law firm. Yeah. You see, you, we've seen that, mm -hmm. where white lawyers are like, I don't know, what the hell are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And that's actually happening? Yeah. You're going, you know, yes. And, and, you know, we got to get comfortable 
with being uncomfortable with it. Yes. Now I got and not making them comfortable. Exactly. I got 35 percent diversity in the D.C. office of Reed Smith. I've been intentional, and our global man managing partner and senior man have been intentional about it. And we openly talk about race and gender, especially when it comes to pitching business. If we're going to pitch a piece of business to a large company and and they've got great diversity or their leadership has diversity, whether it's women or people of color, why would we field an all white male team to go see that company in 2018? So my partners have got to be comfortable about talking about, you know, Scott, who do we have that does SEC work who's an African-American woman? We can't be uncomfortable about that because diverse ideas and diverse teams are better, stronger teams. And we have to be comfortable with that. And if I can make every one of my partners who doesn't look like me, male or female, comfortable about that, whatever office they're in, that's my job as managing and partner. And Julian, what I keep saying is I'm tired of parking lot militants. I'm tired of folks. What is a parking lot militant? A parking lot uh -oh. militant is the person who, before you leave the office, they buy the car and they say, man, this need to happen and this need to happen and this need to happen. And then when they go in that building, you're like, well, where your little parking lot militant ass go? Now you're quiet. My deal is, look, I always said it. They're going to fire you anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, hate. so at least I'm going to say something while I'm there. And I'm saying if we're willing to challenge to educate, take some folks out, enlighten some white boys on pay disparity, enlighten some folks and like, say, bro, you 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 don't recognize it. All the folks on your team, white men. I'm just saying that a, a conversations, dinner or lunch, it also builds relationships. Exactly, it could lead to change. Professionally, final, final yeah. comment before I go to my next story about voting in Georgia. Yeah. My, my final comment is, let's look at economic structure. All this talking... Can you I, talk I about economics doing those conversations? You can talk about okay, economics, so but, 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 but Scott, the, the bottom line economic structural issue is less race than it is class and capitalism. And this is a conversation that nobody wants to have, is how you dismantle capitalism so that you basically distribute resources more fairly. But, that, I, but, but, but I'm going to give you, okay, but I'm going to give you this well, example. Distribute, distribute hold up. Wealth. I'm going to give you this example, last one, of what happens when you do educate somebody who's white, who's in power, who then can also do that. John Landgraf, the CEO of FX Network. He is sitting here going, look at numbers, 80 plus percent of the showrunners of FX shows were white men. Oh, wow. John I Landgraf mm. sends an email, one email to the entire network, and he says, I'm a white man, <laughs> and I like white men. <laughs> we, we talk, are they friends of mine? But this ain't America. He said 50 plus percent of America's women. He said the numbers who are Latino, who are African American, and this is changing. He says, we have to change who is running the shows in our network. Six months later, half of all shows on FX had people of color who were showrunners or people, people, people of color or women. His deal was, I'm a leader. He said, we have to change it. That's what, now that's economics right there because also who, had, who are showrunners, who are creators. And so Donald Glover's show, ATL, the other shows they have, that also changes the game economically I still believe that, look, I don't assume a white person gets it. I don't assume a black person gets it. Right. But what I will right. say is I'm at least had a conversation that if I can have an opportunity to enlighten you and empower you, you might get it or you might not. But at least I'm going to make the effort. And that can speak to economics. I don't believe in wasted conversations. I'm with you on the money part. But again, somebody's got to force it. And if it's going to be us, fine. But I'm not going to wait on somebody else to actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, great conversation here, folks. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real.
Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. <laughs>